Today on the I Am Back in the Land of the Living Says podcast, I will be discussing why podcast networks are terrible at YouTube and other stuff too, so go ahead and stick around. While I was out sick the last couple of weeks, I got an email from a super producer with a link to a Bloomberg article that was discussing YouTube podcasting, the rollout, and the performance of a number of podcast networks on YouTube podcasting. While analyzing NPR, Slate, and New York Time podcasts, what they determined? None of them were doing well. And the author does have some explanation why they aren't doing well. So if you want to know what Ashley Carmen's justification for this is, I do recommend reading the Bloomberg article. I'll link it in the episode notes. But there's one paragraph that I want to focus on. And what it says is, despite their impressive reach elsewhere, these networks' podcasts aren't doing so well on YouTube. Slate's shows averaged around 75 views per video over the past week, while NPR was around 179. The New York Times performed slightly better, especially The Daily, but that show, one of the biggest in the world, still only received around 1,000 views on average over the past week. The monthly numbers for these networks don't look much better. As soon as I finished reading that paragraph, I jumped over to YouTube to take screenshots of NPR podcasts and Slate so I could see what their titles look like, to see what their thumbnails look like, to see how many shows they're posting, what they're offering, and yes, to see what their views are like. And I can see why this article was written because, yikes, these views are brutal. This show, the Bandru Says Podcast, has more views than the almost all of their episodes on these massive corporations podcasting YouTube channels. NPR is hovering between 100 and 300 views for each episode, and Slate is hovering between 30 for a lot of them, up to 700 as an outlier. We have one that is 2,000 views, but overall, not looking too good. But I think we can learn from their lack of success on YouTube proper. So I came up with three reasons why I think these podcast networks aren't succeeding on the platform. Number one is the most obvious, and it is they are using static images and there is no actual video. What I mean... If you click on the majority of their videos, what you get is 50 minutes of the podcast artwork. There is nothing visually interesting when you click on a video. The reason that's important is viewer or consumer expectation. The typical YouTube viewer expects something that will keep their ocular nerves engaged. If they are scrolling through all of the content that's available on YouTube, I think it's 500 hours uploaded every minute. All of the thumbnails, all of the titles, looking for one thing to watch. They see something that catches their attention. The debt ceiling is dumb from Slate Money. They click on it, and what they get is the podcast artwork. They are going to be clicking off incredibly quickly. The reason that's important is the YouTube algorithm. That is what you are looking for when you start uploading your shows to YouTube. You want the benefit of the YouTube algorithm, the discoverability, the new audience. And the reason why people clicking off of your episode is so detrimental to you is completion percentage and view duration. Those are two very big pieces of information that the YouTube algorithm relies on. When a video has an incredibly low completion percentage or an incredibly low view duration, it seems as though how that is interpreted is this video sucks or it is clickbait. So by people clicking on your video, getting a static image, and having them click off within 15 or 30 seconds, that is informing the YouTube algorithm this video sucks or the thumbnail and title are clickbait. How does that impact your video, the distribution, and therefore the potential new audience for your video is going to be limited. YouTube wants nothing to do with clickbait. They do not want 
to be associated with clickbait because that is an incredibly negative thing. If it's clickbait, people are going to leave the platform. And what is the main purpose of YouTube? Keep people watching for as long as possible so they can show more ads. If your video is 30 or 50 minutes long and people are only watching 15 seconds to 30 seconds, that is going to tell YouTube that your content is bad and your content is likely to drive people off of the platform. So YouTube has no reason to show that to a new viewer because they don't want new viewers to be driven off platform. That is why consumer expectation is so important to cater to on YouTube because you want the benefit of the YouTube algorithm and not meeting viewer expectation is going to tell the algorithm your content is bad and because your content is bad, you are going to lose all benefit from the YouTube algorithm. I hope that made sense. The second reason why I don't think these videos are doing well is that the podcast networks are simply re-uploading the full podcast episodes with no shift in the presentation style, with no shift in the delivery, with no adjustment to the formatting, with no adjustment to the length. They are just repurposing existing content. The reason I think that impacts performance is podcast listeners and YouTube viewers have very different expectations of delivery, of presentation, and of format of the content they are consuming. Podcast listeners seem to be willing to go on a 50-minute journey to get to the conclusion. YouTube viewers seem to have shorter attention spans. They know within the first 15 to 30 seconds if they're going to watch your video. That's why for this podcast, how do I start it? Here is what we're going to be talking about today. And here are timestamps in the timeline of the video, in the description. I have to admit, timestamps are likely to decrease the overall watch time of each individual viewer because you're making it easier for them to skip over topics they're not interested in. But it's more likely, in my opinion, to keep more people watching. What I mean... If you have five topics in a podcast, YouTube's the worst company ever. Here's the microphone I'm using. And somebody is only interested in what microphone you're using. They click on the video and you don't discuss that until 15 minutes in. If you don't have timestamps, after 15 seconds of you talking about YouTube, they're probably clicking off. But if they know exactly where you start talking about that microphone, now... They'll skip to that portion of the video and watch for three, four, five minutes. So it improves the standing in the YouTube algorithm, in my opinion. I have also made a few other changes, so I have different edits for the audio version and the video version. The video version does not include the podcast intro music. It also doesn't include plugs to bandrewscott.com or bandrewsays.com or geeksrising.com. Because I want people to get the content that they click on for because that is so incredibly important for YouTube. These podcast networks are not making different edits or different presentation styles between the audio and the video version. They are just repurposing what they made for audio. And to succeed on YouTube, you need to make content for YouTube. That's not what they're doing yet. That is number two. The third reason why I don't think these podcast episodes are doing well is the podcast networks are uploading all of their shows to the same channel. The reason this is impacting the performance is if somebody subscribes to NPR podcasts because they love the show Car Talk, but that's the only show they care about, what are they going to do? When NPR publishes Book of the Day, Life Kit, Shortwave, TED Radio Hour, etc. How does that work? Those videos are first and foremost going to be recommended to subscribers to NPR podcasts. And for this listener who only cares about car talk, when they're recommended Book of the Day, Life Kit, Shortwave, TED Radio Hour, they are not going to click on it. That's a very important piece of data because that is telling the YouTube algorithm this content is not interesting. This topic is not interesting. 
If a subscriber to this channel doesn't even care about it enough to watch it, why are we going to show it to more and more people? The subscribers don't even care about it, so nobody else is gonna care about it. That is why running variety channels is so darn difficult on YouTube, because you may garner an audience for one topic that you publish about, but not the others. So when your subscribers get recommended the stuff they're not interested in, they won't click on it. That's going to harm the distribution of that non-interesting content to your subscribers, as well as the stuff they are interested in. Variety channels are incredibly difficult, and they are running these podcast networks as variety channels. To me, it seems like these podcast networks are doing everything in their power to shoot themselves in the foot and ensure their content isn't going to succeed or isn't going to get the benefit of the YouTube algorithm, of that discoverability that every single podcaster wants so much. So to summarize, how did this all come about? YouTube seems to have courted these podcast networks. Hey, NPR, Slate. New York Times, upload your content to YouTube, upload your podcast episodes to YouTube. And what the podcast networks took that as is, okay, we'll just repurpose the existing content and upload that to YouTube without any regard for what people want on YouTube. So if these networks want to truly leverage the benefit that is available on YouTube, here is what I would recommend. It's not going to be easy. It is a lot of work. I have never said that creating video podcasts is easy. I have never said that uploading your show to YouTube is going to be easy. But this is my advice. Number one, most important, create some form of visual aspect for the uploads because that is what is expected by YouTube viewers. YouTube viewers want video to accompany the video that they click on. Number two, consider creating separate channels for each of your podcasts. That's going to suck for you because if you have 50 podcasts, now you have 50 YouTube channels and you can't just have the channel. You have to have somebody moderating the comments, responding to comments, marketing it, doing something to get eyeballs on that channel. So consider creating separate channels for each of the shows. That's going to ensure that when somebody subscribes to that channel, they are only getting recommended the content that they subscribed for. And number three, consider a secondary edit for the YouTube version of the show. Maybe that means cutting out some fluff at the beginning so the show starts right with the content. Maybe it means creating clips of the show if that's a possibility. But creating content and tailoring it for the YouTube audience is how they would truly benefit from YouTube's algorithm of the discoverability. I think it also shows that podcasts and YouTube music are not taking off in terms of adoption, or at least the people who listen to NPR, Slate, and the Bandrew Says podcasts have not adopted podcasts and YouTube music because... You would expect, hey, I love audio podcasts from NPR. If somebody adopted YouTube music, you would expect those views to be significantly higher. To prove this also impacts the Bandrew Says podcast, I pulled some analytics. And (laughs) this was shocking to me. YouTube music podcasts are not doing well. Or at least the listeners to this show do not care about YouTube music and the podcasts within. The way I found this, I went to the analytics for the Bandrew Says podcast channel. I entered the advanced mode. Then I scrolled over and clicked on a YouTube product. This shows that over the last 90 days on YouTube proper, the Bandrew Says podcast received... 20,426 views. Let me unhide the next section. On YouTube Music, it received a whopping one view. That's not 1,000 views. That is not 
100 views. That is <laughs> that is a single listen, a single view on YouTube music since it is launched. And I am pretty sure that one view is me making sure the show was actually working in YouTube music. One view on YouTube music. All of the advice that I offer these podcast networks holds true, but I think there is something to this. It's, it's exactly as I said when this was announced. I don't think this is going to lead to some huge influx, influx of viewers, of listens. Keep your expectations in check. This is worse than my, <laughs> than my worst expectation of this. A single view. That's it. All right, that is my coverage of the Bloomberg article. Those are my opinions. I will link the Bloomberg article in the description and the episode notes. I will also link the NPR podcasts page and the Slate podcasts page in case you want to see how they perform over the coming months. I think it will be interesting to see once they understand YouTube a bit better, if they make the shift to make more visual content if they adjust the editing practices, if they create separate channels, or if they just continue down the road they're going. And that is it for the news. I didn't look at anything else. I just wanted to talk about that. So let us talk about what I've been testing. If anybody from NPR was watching, they just clicked off. <laughs> this guy's an idiot. I'm not listening to anything he says. I am on the Mojave MA200, the Mojave MA200. It is a cardioid-only tube condenser microphone, and this is how it's been sounding, running into the Universal Audio X8. This has been sitting on my shelf since May 25th, 2020, when I bought it. And I was clipping videos for the Clips Castage channel, and I came across a podcast that I had recorded with the MA201 FET, and I was kind of blown away by it. So I said, oh gosh, that tube mic is still sitting there. I better grab that and throw it on the stand because I loved how the 201 FET sounded. So let me know, what do you think of this? As far as the price and all that, it's 1100 bucks. I paid 1200 bucks with dollars that were worth more. So... <laughs> I have made terrible financial decisions paying more dollars that are worth more three years ago. All right, let's jump to what you had to say. The first comment comes from Eric Nadeau. They say, you may not have made anywhere near half a million dollars from your hard labor, but Google most certainly did. I hope you feel better about it now. Eric, <laughs> this hurts so bad. Because I am almost 100% certain that you're right. I am almost 100% sure that you are correct. That Google has made at least half a million dollars showing ads on my content. It doesn't make me feel better. <laughs> that is such a, a terrible thing to say. It hurts so bad to realize that. So thank you for pointing that out, Eric. I really do appreciate it. Next, we have a comment from Sound Speeds. He says, I'm going to take your cost of being a YouTuber to the next level. I haven't been doing it as long as you, but next month I'll hit six years of producing at least one video weekly on Sound Speeds. The channel costs me money every month because I buy stuff for it constantly, but re refuse to play the algorithm or do reviews which would generate traffic. I refuse to take money for sponsorships and will not accept money to make a video. That's part of the money, but what about the hours spent as you mentioned? Or for a husband and dad, what about the time I spent on YouTube instead of doing something for or with my family? Many times when I do sit down to do something with them, I get drowsy and doze because I'm exhausted. What about the time I could be spending on resting properly so I'm not tired all the time and burning the candle at both ends, which ultimately will catch up with me 
in time. How about the hours spent sitting at a desk researching, recording, or editing instead of exercising or going out to do something? How often have I eaten a snack while editing just because it was something to do while previewing a 20-minute long video before releasing it? What about the time I could have spent hanging with friends but instead was too tired and just wanted to sit at my desk instead? People say, you're building a legacy. But you know better than anyone else I know, as soon as something happens, like your studio flooding, that prevents you from releasing videos for a few weeks, YouTube starts dropping you in the searches which tanks all of your hard work. Some legacy. Alan, thank you very much for the comment. You are exactly right. The opportunity cost of doing YouTube does not stop at the monetary cost. It's not just my hourly wage is 50 bucks, I spent 10 hours making a video, therefore I have foregone $500 in earnings. It's not just monetary. It extends to what else you could be doing that is necessary, important, or just fun. You could be spending time with your family. You could be exercising. You could be cooking a meal that is healthier for you. You could be getting a good amount of sleep and resting up so you feel well enough to go out and go for a walk. All of those are opportunity costs. The health aspect of working too much is a huge opportunity, co opportunity cost of YouTube. That is a massive cost of YouTube. The mental health aspect of doing YouTube is a huge cost of YouTube. It's why you see so many people burn out because they work so hard to try to appease the YouTube algorithm that they end up working too much and they can't keep it up. There are so many costs to doing YouTube and you are exactly right. Spending time with your family, having a good night's rest, having a decent meal, not sitting down and living a sedentary life while you monitor a video, review a video, while you eat snacks just because it keeps you engaged. Those are all costs of being a YouTuber. And you are exactly right. As soon as something happens and the regularity of your upload stops, the algorithm no longer favors you. You start to fall. Fall down those search results, fall down the recommendations, fall down all of the all of the badness that YouTubers fear. There, there's a reason they fear them. I missed, I think, only two weeks because I got the COVID. I think I got the black lung pop. <laughs> and I missed two weeks. It felt like a month and a half, but just a couple of weeks. The analytics look brutal brutal views way down a lot more down a lot more than just the videos that I didn't upload because each video maybe gets 10 15,000 views my views are not down only 30,000 they are down significantly more than that my subscribers down significantly more than that so yes as soon as you stop uploading you fall out of favor with the YouTube algorithm and that is some legacy. That is some legacy. Thank you very much for the comment and the additional insight, Alan. I appreciate uh, Check out Sound Speeds, by the way, if you're interested in professional audio. He has done some very fun uh, reaction videos, is what they're called. What was, I, what was I trying to say that started with an I? I have no idea. Let's go to the next comment, which comes from Daily Tech News. They say, Bandrew, I have to ask. You have all of these things you're doing in a day. You're constantly switching tasks. Have you always been able to just get up and do the next thing that has to get done? Or have you developed this ability? And if you did, could you think of any examples of how you did so? For me, I've noticed that it's really not about time. It's more about energy or willpower or discipline or something like that. I always, well, most of the time, find myself in such a frustrating position late in the evening with all of the things I wanted to get done, but I just didn't. 
I just ended up procrastinating by literally just not doing anything, just walking around the house, sort of getting ready to get down to it and thinking about whatever. And well, it really sucks because I don't do the things that I should, and I also don't enjoy my time as I just end up wasting it. Daily Tech News or DTN, thank you very much for the comment. That is a great question. I do not find it easy to switch between all of the tasks that I do. Going from my day job to starting working on YouTube is not simple for me. It is not easy for me. That is why I started going for walks. I go for a walk in the morning to kind of get in the mood to start my day job. I go for a walk after work to get out of the mood of doing my day job. Kind of separates the two. But I find the hardest part of doing anything is the act of beginning it, the act of starting it. And the way that I do this, the way that I overcome that initial hurdle can be viewed as kind of negative, can be viewed as a mind trick, but I just remind myself, no one is going to do anything for you. Nobody's going to do this for you. If you want the video to get done, if you want the podcast to get done, how is that going to happen? You have to do it. So get off your butt and do the thing, you lazy bum. Do it. Nobody's going to do it for you. Do you want to get ahead in life? Do it yourself. You have to put in the work. I have to fight myself every single day because, let me tell you, I would love to be sitting on the couch watching X-Files right now. You know what? I am going to include a clip from before I started recording this podcast right here. I will include the clip right here so you can see how I start almost every single video that I record. I really am not feeling up for recording, but I am going to do it. I have to admit, doing the reviews is so much easier when I'm recovering from COVID because I can do an hour here, two hours here, four hours here, over a week or two. But with this podcast, it is a marathon. Because I have to sit down on Sunday, do the research, do the outline, record, edit, record, edit. It's just a nightmare. And I don't feel like doing it. Maybe I shouldn't be doing it, but I'm going to. Whatever. Whatever. What else would I do? Watch X-Files? Do I really need to watch X-Files again? Do I really need to watch another movie I don't know. So, let's just go ahead and get started. Now that you know my secret, how I start all of my recordings, I will admit, most of the time after work, after I go for my walk, I am sitting on the couch. During the weekends, I am sitting on the couch trying to relax. I begrudgingly pause the X-Files. I groan, Ugh, I don't want to do this. I just want to relax. And then I stand up, I walk in here, I sit down, I grab my water, I take a sip, and I just force myself to get to work. Once I've started, the time flies by. There are days where I have off days, like today after a three weeks of not doing a show, I am off my game, I get frustrated the majority of the recording process, and I think maybe I should just stop doing the podcast. So that still occurs. But once you actually begin the process, it gets a lot better and time flies by and it becomes quite a bit more fun. Now, let me point out, when you start making videos, when you start making podcasts, when you initially start that, it is easy. It is easy because the passion is strong. You are super duper excited about it. Oh my God, I need to scream this from the mountaintops. I love microphones. I love movies or daily tech news. This is the greatest. That's when it's easy. Once the passion kind of dwindles, once you get past that honeymoon phase of creating content, that's where you, you have to kick yourself in the butt. You have to light the fire under your rear end. 
And I think that's why we see so many content creators who will start a podcast for seven episodes. We'll see YouTubers who upload for six months and then stop. Because the passion dwindles and it becomes the slog. It becomes the the difficult process of motivating yourself that content creation truly is. So if I could offer one piece of advice, I would say sit down and prioritize what is important to you. What is the most important thing to you? Is it spending time with family? Is it your day job? Is it your podcast? And then focus on number one, number two, number three. And then with your free time, focus on the next thing. If you prioritize getting a video or a podcast done and you know nobody's going to do it for you, You will find the motivation to get off your butt and do it. Just sit down and get to work. Leave your phones in the other room. Leave all the distractions in the other room. You will find the motivation to do it. But if you need to prioritize relaxation, if you need to prioritize healing up from the cough, you can do that. I just did it. I took three weeks off from this podcast. I took two weeks off from the main channel and I prioritized my health over YouTube, over podcasting. And both things suffered for it. But that doesn't matter because I am feeling much better now. I'm like Misha Barton in Sixth Sense after I vomit on myself in a tent in the bedroom. I'm feeling much better now. If you didn't know, that was Misha Barton. That was a that's a bizarre realization that that was the girl from the OC who vomited on herself because her mom was poisoning her. Spoiler alerts, I guess. Thank you very much for the comment, DTN. I appreciate you. Next, we have a comment from Hungry for UFO to never suffer a reboot. They ask, who did the voiceover at the end? Thank you very much for that question. I don't give him a shout out enough. The VO for the outro was done by Sean Milo. He is a professional voiceover artist, does a lot of audiobooks, some very popular audiobooks, and I have been using his outro for years at this point. And the reason I switched is because the outro that I had done before had improper grammar, and I think it drove Sean insane. Hey, you're you. (laughs) That's not how you speak English. Fix it. And that's why I switched. So, Sean Milo. I think you can search Sean Milo in Audible and find the audiobooks that he does. There are some very, very highly rated books he's narrated. Thank you for the question. That is it for this week. No Ask Bandrews that I am doing. I have been recording way too long off my game because it has been a few weeks since I have recorded. Missing a week, you don't just get screwed by the algorithm. You kind of get screwed by your mind and your body and your abilities and skills because they just disappear. This is not like riding a bicycle for me. You do forget how to podcast and you get bad at it. That is it. Thank you so much for coming by and listening this week. Thank you for sticking with me. I love you. I hope you have an amazing Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Next Sunday, I will talk at you. Bye-bye. Whoa. Whoa. Boop. This has been a Geeks Rising production. Your executive producer is Bandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.